Hey guys, do y'all treat atrial fibrillation? You know, the kind with a rapid ventricular response? I'll bet you do, and I'll bet you have some questions. Should I be using diltiazem or metoprolol to slow that rate down? And if I have to cardiovert, should I be using anterior posterior pad placement? Or should I go with the anterior lateral placement? What does the literature say? Well, that is a great question. Stay tuned for two papers that can help us with these questions. What is a lighthouse? It is a tower with a bright light at the top, located in an important or dangerous place. The main purpose of a lighthouse is to serve as a navigational aid and to warn of dangerous areas. Welcome to the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. Illuminating the darkness of current EMS clinical practice with the bright light of science. Here's your host, Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Howdy, y'all. I'm Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Welcome back to another episode of the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. Today, we're talking atrial fibrillation. So before we get into the papers, let's briefly talk about what our objectives are when treating atrial fibrillation. Now, there are really two main objectives. The first is rate control, where we're trying to control or slow down rapid ventricular response. And then the second is rhythm control. In other words, getting the patient back into sinus rhythm. We have a paper about both of these goals. To keep these videos short, I'm going to try something different here. I'm going to break the papers up into two videos. Now, since people seem to prefer short videos but longer podcasts, I'm going to talk about both papers together in the podcast, but split them up into two videos. In other words, one podcast, two videos. Tell me what you think about this. Let me know if you like it. With that in mind, Let's get back to the papers. So let's start with rate control. Now, the most commonly used drugs for rate control are calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Now, there are lots of examples in both classes, but there are really two that most providers use. Diltiazem is the calcium channel blocker and metoprolol as the beta blocker. Now, diltiazem, that is what's called a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, just like verapamil. Verapamil is also a non-dihydropyridine. Now, if there is a non-dihydropyridine, that means there must be a dihydropyridine, and there is. Those are drugs like nifedipine and amlodipine. Well, what's the difference? Well, the non-dihydropyridines like diltiazem and verapamil lower blood pressure a little bit, but they have much more of an effect lowering heart rate and lowering conduction through the AV node. On the other hand, those dihydropyridines, the nifedipine, the amlodipines, they have more of an effect dilating the arterioles and decreasing arterial resistance. That makes them great for treating hypertension, but because this can actually cause some reflex tachycardia, not so much so for rate control and AFib. Now, verapamil used to be used all the time for rate control. And as a matter of fact, that was what I used when I was a brand new paramedic. But for the most part, it's been replaced by diltiazem, primarily because diltiazem seems to be associated with less hypotension. Now, of the beta blockers, metoprolol is the most commonly given, although some providers, like maybe me from time to time, will use an infusion of esmolol instead. Metoprolol is more common, though, probably because it's given by IV bolus, and logistically, it's just a whole lot easier than setting up infusions. The general consensus in the literature about the differences between these two drugs is that there really isn't much of one. DILT, metoprolol, meh, they're about the same. However, there does seem to be this constant back and forth in the literature where one shows a little advantage, the other shows a little advantage with another drug. And that's why a meta-analysis can be helpful. And as it turns out, one of those was just published. 
So this paper is titled Intravenous Diltiazem versus Metoprolol for Atrial Fibrillation with Rapid Ventricular Response, a meta-analysis. It was published in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine by Drs. Lan, Wu, Han, and colleagues earlier this year, 2022. The citation is going to be in the show notes. One of the interesting things about this paper is it was done by Chinese authors, and they included papers that were listed in Chinese language indices, so things other than PubMed. And that means they might be capturing in some papers from say, indices that we wouldn't normally see. And when it comes to a meta-analysis, that's actually a good thing. Well, they included prospective and observational studies of adults with atrial fibrillation and rapid ventricular response that addressed one of the following endpoints. Efficacy, in other words, how well does it work? How long does it take to achieve rate control? Whether there were vital sign changes, in other words, did one drop the heart rate more than the other? And were there any difference in adverse events? They excluded duplicate papers and those that didn't look at these specific endpoints. They excluded papers if they were case control papers or guidelines or opinion pieces. And finally, they excluded papers with what they call wrong data. Now, I don't know what the hell wrong data means. That seems a little squishy to me. And it's not any less squishy because they didn't define it. Now, it turns out there were several things in this paper that were a little bit squishy and not defined, and we'll talk about those as we go. The wrong data thing may just be a translation issue, but some of the other ones, not so much. They really should have defined them. They started off with 315 papers that they screened and ultimately ended up with 17 that met their criteria. These were nine randomized controlled trials, and eight observational studies. They felt like um, 10 of these were high quality with a low risk of bias, and they felt like seven of them were lower quality with a higher risk of bias. So ultimately, they ended up with 1,214 patients, 643 of them getting diltiazem, and 571 getting metoprolol. The doses that were included in the trials of these drugs, they were kind of variable, but for the most part, they're similar to what we commonly use. Diltiazem, for example, that was either 10 milligrams or 0.25 milligrams in most of these papers. And metoprolol, well, that was about 5 milligrams in the vast majority. A couple of them used 2.5. Now, some of the papers did not include a dose, And that's kind of a problematic weakness of the paper. Most of these were small studies. The largest enrolled only 80 patients. So we're not talking huge randomized control trials here. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the details of this paper because I honestly don't think it was that great of a paper. But since AFib with RVR is a pretty common problem, we see it commonly. And this paper is a meta-analysis, meaning it pulls together a lot of other papers. I kind of think that despite these weaknesses, it probably does come up with the right answer. Now, I sort of have to admit a bias here because the answer they came up with is the answer that I like best. In other words, it is reinforcing my existing practice. So I like that, but I do want to be honest about that, meaning I may be a little bit biased here. Now, like all meta-analyses, they combine the results of different trials to try to end up with a larger data set that they can come up with an analysis on. And that's exactly what they did here for these outcomes. So let's start going over what these outcomes are. Now, the first one let's talk about is efficacy. In other words, how well did it achieve rate control? Now, one of the problems I have with this paper is that they don't define what efficacy means. Now, my assumption is that efficacy means you ended up with a sustained ventricular rate less than, say, 100, but the paper just doesn't define it. I did pull a couple of the component papers, and they talk about a rate less than 100, but the meta-analysis doesn't, and that's definitely a weakness. Figure two in the paper and that I'm also going to put in the show notes, it's a forest plot showing the point estimate in 95% confident intervals for 
all of the trials that um, addressed efficacy. And what they did is they actually broke this down by time interval. So in other words, what was what did this paper show was a better drug at five minutes or rate control at 10 minutes or 20 minutes and so on. So ultimately, what did they see? Well, they found no difference in the rate control between the two drugs at five or 10 minutes. However, when you get to 30, 60, and 90 minutes, as well as all time intervals combined, there was a significant difference that favored diltiazem. Now, this is definitely statistically significant. Well, how about clinically significant? Well, they calculate a risk ratio, and it was 1.1. That means there is an 11% increased risk, if you will, of having rate control using diltiazem versus metoprolol. Now, the confidence interval was from 0.106 to 0.16. Pretty narrow confidence interval, but a pretty narrow confidence interval showing a pretty small benefit. And I think that's consistent with most of the other literature. Well, how about average time of onset? This outcome was addressed in seven papers that reported on a total of 411 patients. Overall, they found diltiazem worked just a bit faster than metoprolol. Again, they don't define what worked meant, but DILT did whatever it did about one minute faster. Now, if you really want to know the numbers, that means DILT got this rate control in an average of 9.7 minutes compared to 10.8 minutes with metoprolol. And they did find that this was statistically significant. Now, honestly, statistically significant is important, but I only really care if it's clinically relevant also. And I'm finding it kind of hard to get all that excited about DILT working a minute faster than metoprolol in a patient that I'm considering clinically stable. Because if they weren't stable, well, I wouldn't be giving drugs anyway. I'd just go straight to cardioversion. So I'm not so excited about the onset of action. Now, they also did this analysis for changes in heart rate, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. To really get to the point, they showed that DILT lowered the heart rate 9.5 beats per minute faster than metoprolol, which was statistically significant. They found that metoprolol had more of an impact on lowering systolic blood pressure, a whopping 4 millimeters of mercury more than DILT, and no difference in the diastolic blood pressure drop or adverse events. Again, I'm not going to get all that excited about 9 beats per minute or 4 millimeters of mercury. Really, I don't care. So what was the paper's conclusion? What did the authors think? Well, they came down pretty hard on the conclusion that diltiazem is clearly better and that's what we should be using. All right. You can probably tell that I think they overstate the strength of their findings by just a bit, by just that much. And I like that they said that there was no difference in adverse events. I think they oversold the benefit of diltiazem, or at least the magnitude of that benefit of diltiazem. My take on this paper is that while it isn't the best written paper, seriously, would some definitions have killed them? Maybe just, just one? What does work mean? Despite that, I do think it provides some valuable information. DILT has a real, albeit small, efficacy benefit over metoprolol. I think the bottom line is you probably ought to use what you like and what you're comfortable with. And for my EMS colleagues, what you actually have available. Now, as for my clinical practice, I'm going to continue using diltiazem for most patients because I like it better, because I can point to this paper to support the practice. Now, there are still some patients that I'm going to go for metoprolol or even esmolol. Now, maybe I'm looking at a patient with that's already on a beta blocker and, you know, I just want to stick with that. Or maybe I'm looking at one with a known decreased ejection fraction where I'd like to stay away from diltiazem and go maybe with a beta blocker instead. So that's the first paper we have on AFib. I hope you found this to be useful information. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to the FlightBridge Ed channel. 
and tell your friends, tell your partners about us. Be on the lookout for the next video on the best pad position to use with rhythm control when you're trying to electrically cardiovert a patient. All right, guys, that's all I got. Thanks a lot and take care. You've been listening to the EMS Lighthouse Project Podcast, a proud member of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast family and a Fire Dog production. Visit flightbridgeed.com for more information.